Very good. Thank you, Nanette and authors. I would like to invite all of our speakers back on screen for the Q&A session. Uh, also joining us are Laura Strochi, co-author of the Influences paper at the University of South Australia, and Kushar Rajavi at uh, Sheller College of Business, Georgia Institute of Technology, and Don Lehman uh, at Columbia University Business School. Both are authors of the best paper on ad expenditures uh, led by uh, Kushar. So welcome back. Um, we have a number of speakers. I'm Ideally, I'm going to try to sort of weave all the papers together. So uh, there, are, I think, are really are two common themes that go across the papers. Uh, one has to do with influencers, endorsers, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and the second has to do with brand equity, uh, what we just heard in terms of mature social sites as opposed to TikTok, which is sort of uh, new and growing. And so um, I, I spent a lot of time in the TV industry, and I kind of see a parallel there uh, between, I will say, where the networks are and where user-generated content is. Um, and so let's let's focus on the theme of double jeopardy. Um, the networks and the video ad bureau here in the United States are very heavily promoting uh, the value of professionally produced programming and the quality associated with professionally produced programming. Um, and connected to uh, Kushaw's paper, um, you know, it, these would be high brand equity. In, in contrast, I think of user-generated content much more like TikTok. Um, let's let's start with with double double jeopardy. Do we think in any way that the TV industry in the United States is being sort of characterized in the same way that you found with the social media, uh, TikTok versus, uh, say, Facebook? That one I think uh, would be Vanessa and, and, and Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the question. So definitely interesting. When, I, when we look at social media, we consider them the modern broadcast media per excellence. And really, TV as a traditional media is the only a true obstacle or competitor to the social media. So we definitely see a, a strong similarity in traditional audience measurement, traditional audience behavior analysis and empirical patterns and KPIs that we have looked into in the past 50 something years and what we're actually exploring nowadays with, with TikTok. In fact, in our study, TikTok was the only social media platform that revealed exactly what we expected and what we were thinking was going to happen. So essentially very similar to what would be in um, seen in, in TV for, for decades. Um, and uh, we hope that moving forward, this will create a lot of nice synergies in, also in terms of data sources so that we can triangulate the behavior of people and the behavior of our audiences across all of the different media types. I see. Um, we may have lost uh, Don, but we have Kevin Kushar, uh, and uh, let's see, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm relating to uh, your findings on, uh, I think, high brand equity, how things work differently for high brand equity, and I, I associate networks with high brand equity and user-generated content maybe with a little bit less so. Um, so I guess my question is, do you, do you think that the process is essentially the same? And I, I do want to introduce, because there was a question I don't think that anybody has answered um, about what happened during COVID when people pulled back in terms of their ad spend. Um, we've done research, and long story short, what we found was that small and mid-sized brands were very sensitive to their ad spend, increase in share of uh, voice, increase in share of market, and vice versa. Large brands, not so much. Really, it was their trajectory that carried them forward. Um, so I don't know if you can relate to television with big brands like networks and then smaller brands, user-generated content. But but if you had done your study in, instead of brands like Gucci, um, where do you think the networks and the user-generated content would come out? Yeah, so I agree with you, Paul. Uh, we also find that the effective advertising expenditures on perceived quality is weaker for uh, larger brands. We have a combination of smaller brands and larger brands, and that allows us to uh, dis distinguish between the advertising effectiveness across all of them. So our finding is consistent with what you just said. This could be because of the ceiling effect because they have already they are already high in terms in terms of perceived quality, so ad expenditures are not going to do a lot more for them. 
Another explanation could be that for big brands, we, we have different resources to learn about them, to learn about their quality. It could be through our friends. It could be through our uh, the news, the things that we read online. So it's the smaller brands that benefit most from the advertising expenditures. And uh, that also relates to that idea of uh, less at expenditures during COVID, which brands, which categories are going to suffer more. I think uh, smaller brands would generally suffer more. Uh, and in terms of uh, categories to answer to uh, Lee's question online, well, it, it depends on many factors. Uh, it could depend on the behavior of competitors in categories that all others are reducing their advertising expenditures in the same amount. Maybe the amount that the brand is going to suffer is not going to be that much. But at the same time, it gives the opportunity uh, for brands to use that uh, space without, uh, with less clutter to convey their message to consumers. Our research also uh, implies that brands in categories with low involvement and in categories where new products are frequently introduced are going to suffer more uh, from reduction of advertising expenditures during COVID. But there's also, when it, when it comes to other outcomes such as sales, there's also research in the past, uh, the papers by Fenrir that's all 2013 that have looked at different product categories within CPG and how they were affected in terms of their advertising effectiveness during the global financial crisis, which would uh, help address these questions. Super, thank you. Now on to artificial intelligence, influencers and endorsers. <laughs> Where are we going with uh, all of this? I, I recall the words tightly scripted. Um, and I suppose right now, if my endorser is an avatar, it's fairly tightly scripted, but are we looking at a future um, of autonomous endorsers and inf influencers uh, driven by generative AI? This, I'm this by the way, is the subject in, of the but I wanted to give a chance to other people to also have a bit of a say, otherwise I'm happy to. Uh, Fire away. And welcome back, Don. <laughs> Hello. Um, well, we know that generative AI is very strong, obviously, in any form of content marketing and social media marketing and influencer marketing in particular. And there's a few areas where I think it's already well established and on set. And speaking of influencers, it's not just about um, virtual influencers or avatars, but it's really about improving, once again, these um, the choice that marketers and managers make when it comes to picking the right influencer for the right brand and for the right target audience. Um, I've just recently read something on influencer marketing HubSpot, um, uh, a, bl a blog on, from HubSpot, and they were saying that there's new AI that can help you analyzing the tone of voice, the accent, and the mannerism of the influencers to make sure that you can be then predicted if it is going to match your brand voice and also the target audience to they claim a very high level of accuracy. So I can see that it's going to continue to really impact influencer marketing behind the scene, not just in terms of the tip of the iceberg that we see with the virtual influencers, but also very much so in the space of um, campaign management, choosing the influencers, tracking the performance of the influencers and matching the content, the voice, the persona to the brand and what it stands for, I think. Those are good. Go just, just quickly, I, I just wanted to say that um, in general, I mean, with other research I've done, um, people hate um, if, if an ad has an AI influencer. Uh, they, they, it, it performs worse on almost every metric you, we have. Um, however, if, if, if that, uh, that uh, AI, AI influencer is... Uh, uh, able to uh, autonomously um, uh, create content by itself, and and, and it it has sort of a a mind, uh, so it can experience things as well as as uh, 
has agency, um, that negative effects uh, actually disappear, at least experimental, right? right? Right now, we don't really know. The other thing is, is it's, it's brand new right now, and people are afraid of AI. Um, but but I just want to say, like, if, if, there, if, if an AI um, has scraped your data, um, understands what how you like to be approached uh what 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 your preferences are um and uh looks similar to your partner or your parent or something like that how persuasive is that is that uh mess is going to be and and really um uh enable you to change your attitudes and behaviors towards uh, products we could talk about this for hours, but we only have one minute left. So we're going to do a lightning round for everybody. AI in advertising, more good or more bad? Jennifer, why don't we start with you? I, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm, I'm remain skeptical, but I know that this future is here. So too soon to, too soon to weigh in. I'm just going to go around my, my Hollywood Squares uh, screen. Laura, more good or more bad? I am a very risk adverse person, more bad from an ethical point of view, more promise from analytics, KPIs, measurements, tracking point of view. Kevin, more good, more bad. You know, more everything. And I think it's going to be good and bad and everything in between. Okay. Uh, Kushar. I would say it could be better for smaller brands. I don't know about the bigger brands. Yeah, for efficiency, I guess. Matt, yeah. more good, more bad. More bad. I'm going to stand up for real people and real connections. That, that's never <laughs> going to get old. Uh, Kirk. More uh, good, more bad. I'm going with Kevin. Uh, with more of everything. So good and bad. Very good. Don, last word. More good, more bad. AI and advertising. Oh, you, you're on mute. Or you can give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I think it uh, depends on the category. Uh, there are certain categories where AI just doesn't feel right. The more personal, mm -hmm. uh, emotional categories, where, where if it's a tool, you know, you're selling hammers or something exciting like that, I, I, I don't think there's as much resistance to AI. Got it. Very good. Well, thank you everyone for participating. Um, this was a, a great session. Meantime, I hope you plan on attending our forecasting conference, uh, which is on July 18th, uh, among other upcoming events. Uh, go to the ARF.org to register for that and to see what else is coming up. And uh, as mentioned previously, there'll be a quick uh, two question survey popping up on your screen. Thanks again and have a, a good afternoon, Paul. <laughs>